really interesting thing here is that the brain can't tell the difference between perceived and real danger. So while we have a danger, or we have a complex VUCA environment right now, the story that people are perpetuating in their minds, even when there's learned health professionals giving them information to give them reassurance, if they're running the program in their mind like this is the end, this is the destruction, and they're buying into the story that's fed by people who, who knows, they may have an agenda to run that fear, um, they're going to be in an unresourceful state. This is Recovery After Stroke with Bill Gassiamis, helping you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. Bill from recoveryafterstroke.com. This is episode 91, and my guest today is Dr. Jim Karajanis. Jim is a doctor of chiropractic and is especially passionate about the areas of mindset and personal growth, and this fuels his voracious learning appetite, and he has a fascination in the area of neuroscience and is focused on optimizing human potential. As a certified neurobehavioral modeler, business, and life coach, Jim is focused on empowering all those he works with to focus on who they need to become in order to achieve their outcomes and to live their ultimate purpose. Now, just before we get started, if you feel like you need some support during these times, ensure you reach out to someone in your area that can help. Be courageous and just ask. If you would like to reach out to me, you can do so by sending an email to bill at recoveryafterstroke.com. Now it's on with the show. Jim Karajanis. Welcome That's to the it. podcast. Thanks, Bill. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here, man. Um, really important episode we're going to do today. Uh, things have gone a little bit uh, pear-shaped for their entire, <laughs> the entire planet, just to be, yeah. um, just to you know, try and put a bit of a dampener on all the craziness and all the fear and all the stress that people are going through. Um, and I just love the way that you go about. Uh, giving perspective and uh, supporting people to shift them from patterns of behavior that they're perhaps not aware of that are causing them difficulty in the way that they feel. Yeah. So when I was going across Facebook and came across your post, uh, The Rider and the Elephant, yeah, it really resonated with me. And I wanted you to share that story and tell us a little bit about the rider and the elephant and how that relates to you. And then we'll go into a deeper conversation about today's topic. Okay. So I, I, I've, all, I've been aware of uh, an analogy of the rider and elephant, but I had, had an opportunity to feel and express that or to experience it firsthand. So uh, my wife, Bettina, and I, we went to Thailand a few years ago. Uh, might have been about three or four years ago. And... Uh, we went and visited an ecotourism uh, park for elephants. And it was a beautiful habitat, wonderful environment. They were really well catered and looked after. And, and the the people there said, hey, listen, would you like to ride an elephant? I'm like, absolutely. This would be a wonderful experience and opportunity. So so as we're getting on the the, the elephant, they, we had to go up a couple of flights of stairs to get up um, the, the elephant and sit on the seat. And as I'm about to get on the seat, the 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 animal, the elephant trainer says, "Hey, would you like to sit on its neck? Um, because that you get a really wonderful, fantastic experience." And I went, oh, "I love adventure." And I went, "You know what? Why not?" So I got on to the elephant's neck, and it was such a powerful animal and powerful beast. And as I'm sitting, and every step I could feel, every step that it was moving on, I, I could feel it. And, and they told me that the best way for me to be able to um, get the best experiences by tightening up my knees. And if I tightened my knees and kind of tightened it a little bit more on one side, I could veer the animal to one side. And if I tightened my knees and squeezed them in another direction, I could move the elephant to the other way. And that was the perception was that you can control the situation. So it gave me the perception as the rider that I'm controlling this elephant. And everything was going fantastically well, um, enjoying the ride. And as we would have probably been riding for half an hour or so, as we got to the end of the ride, within about the last, you know, five, three, four hundred meters, there was a car uh, backfired, and the elephant was startled. And like I never knew the elephants could move that fast, because in an instant, it, li it literally just turned around and changed direction, 
and it was bolting. And here I was, I couldn't hold on with my ne- hands. I couldn't hand, handle, uh, it, all, all I could do was actually hold on with my knees. So I'm squeezing the daylights out of um, the neck just to hold on. Uh, Bettina by, uh, at that stage is behind me in the seat, just holding on. Uh, so we, the, the, the animal, the, the elephant just went crazy. And it only started, I thought we were going to die, to be honest, because it was just so fast, so rapid, so quick. And no matter what I was saying, I couldn't get through to the elephant. Hey, stop, stop, stop. And it was only when the animal trainer and the elephant trainer could calm down the elephant that he could slow it down, that then he could hear the demands or that he could actually take on board the the directional changes that I was squeezing that I was trying to do in the first place. So that was the experience of it. And there's a, there's a psychologist called Jonathan Haidt who wrote a book um, about that analogy and the, it really resonated with me a lot because the elephant and the rider is, is a, very, a metaphor for, for life in a lot of ways where the elephant represents the emotions and the rider represents the logic. And to me, it really gave me a tangible experience and a tangible reference to say that we feel as riders or logically we can control things, but we're very emotionally driven. And the moment that the emotions are out of control, uh, and, and you mentioned earlier on about what's going on at the moment, the emotions run the show. And the only way that the rider can be heard is once you calm down the animal, once you calm down that emotional response. And so, like I said, I, I had a practical experience to reinforce just how powerful the emotions are. And the moment that they are out of control, um, you know, even the voices of logic, which is what we're hearing at the moment, cannot be heard because of the emotional response. Yeah. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. Coronavirus, right? Yeah, yeah. So that analogy of the elephant and the rider is exactly what's happening now. The coronavirus situation yeah. was not much of a situation. And if you don't really follow the news or pay attention, um, it's not happening until one day your government in the country that you're living in says we're shutting everything down there is no more uh, getting out and about connecting with people being in public in mass gatherings etc and all of a sudden the uh, rider who was going along life just beautifully and everything was uh, occurring in the way that it always had all of a sudden is sitting on this beast which is decided to take a different approach to how it's going to do things from now on. And and all of a sudden, people are, are trying to hold on to this new way of existence, a new way of being, and they don't have uh, any reference point for how to be able to hold on in this situation where... Um, uh, where things have changed and changed so rapidly and now they are potentially feeling uh, feeling emotions that they've always had but are now being elevated because of a change and a seemingly uh, situation where things are not in their control anymore and they're also being manipulated by the things that they consume on social media on the media the broad media television newspapers etc yep and yep. 100% and there is a sense of uh, this thing spiraling and the more that people get anxious the more they uh, impact the people next to them or near them the more they increase anxiety for those people and then this snowball effect happens and then we get to a point where um, unless somebody can come along and we can stop for long enough and pay attention to how we are being uh, influenced in a negative way uh, by the people around us, by the things that we consume and by the environment which we um, don't really have much of a control over, um, there's, there's really no way of getting out of the stuckness unless you're able to take a breath and stop for a moment and just pay attention to what we can do 
differently to bring control back to the things that we can control, to start giving us that rays of hope and then create the snowball effect towards calmness and things leveling out and things being better, which then influences the people around us to start going down the same path. And then we start getting a whole uh, movement of a shift again in emotional experiences and calmness starts to take hold again. Yep. We don't yep. know how long it's going to take for these stories and this narrative to change from the, uh, uh, from the media. We don't know how long it's going to take to change to the opposite end. So we have to start managing our own emotions. Now, tell me a little bit about the challenges that people are facing, how you see it, what are the challenges and what's driving those challenges for them. And then in a little while, we'll talk about how to solve those problems because people are talking about the problem right now yeah. and they're not really focusing on the solutions. Yep. Okay. Um, look, 100% I agree with a lot of what you're saying. And, and right now, uh, you're correct. We're, we're navigating uncharted territory. You know, no one's in, a, in my lifetime, I've certainly not seen anything like this. And most people haven't either. So the military uh, came up with the term many years ago which I think is quite appropriate here, it's called VUCA, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And it really reflects that you don't know what's going on. And in that process, um, you can't make great logical decisions on all amounts of information because you don't have all the amounts of information that you require. And in the absence of certainty in self, quite often you, you'll tag on to whatever information is put out there, whether it's correct factually or whether it's, um, scaremongering. So people will look to the person who's got the greatest level of certainty, even if they're on the wrong track, as a way of solidifying themselves. So a, a really interesting thing, what happens um, neurophysiologically is that what we've got right now is a, a fright, flight, fight, freeze response where the body's maximally under threat and danger. So the primitive parts of the brain are sensing that and going, what do I have to do to survive? So right now, what's happening is it's, it's running a software program in its brain, which is geared towards survival and danger. If you've had a stroke and are in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind, like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously because you've never had a stroke before, you probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called Seven Questions to Ask Your Doctor About Your Stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. The really interesting thing here is that the brain can't tell the difference between perceived and real danger. So while we have a dangerous, or we have a complex VUCA environment right now, the story that people are perpetuating in their minds, even when there's learned health professionals giving them information to give them reassurance, if they're running the program in their mind like this is the end, this is the destruction, and they're buying into the story that's fed by people who, who knows, they may have an agenda to run that fear, um, they're going to be in an unresourceful state. So they're going to be... Uh, basically riding that animal, riding that elephant like I was with the emotions totally out of control. And doesn't matter what they try and do, even if you've got the best resources available, even if you've got the right action steps to that, you can't be, they can't be accessed, they can't be heard. So to me right now is, you know, we've got the reality of the situation, which is, you know, tough enough as it is, but overlaying that is the, story and the interpretation and the and the extra oxygen that it's been fed by um, by all other outlets which may may not necessarily be helping the situation so 
you know what you just told me reminds me of stroke my audience yeah. is stroke survivors yeah and they've been through this exact thing in a very small scale um, yeah. personally and then their life became overwhelmed with discussions and with interest and with people around them that spoke about stroke what happened to them spoke about all the problems and spoke about all the challenges and perhaps at some point they focused on how bad the stroke was and what they were losing and what they were missing out on, et cetera. And then all of a sudden the conversation started to turn about, wow, recovery, possibilities, solutions, overcoming challenges, learning new things, et cetera. It doesn't seem to me to be a different circumstance here. Like is it's a global issue that we're all facing, but stroke survivors and anyone who's survived something dramatic with their health and well-being has been here before they have a reference for when so to speak the shit hit the fan and then yep. things got better and they started to recover and at some point i believe that they start they stopped listening to the external voices about all the problems and they started focusing on how they can help themselves now one of the other things that you spoke about is there's this certain steps that we could take to get beyond challenges and challenging times and you spoke about adapting, innovating, embracing the challenges, um, adding value to other parts of our world, like whether it's yeah. other people, et cetera. You spoke yeah. about modifying their established, uh, established practices and doing something different. And you spoke yeah. about, and you gave us words like pivot and adapt um, yeah. to the current landscape. And you're talking about navigating the, the challenges. If somebody has... Uh, is wondering how they can start changing and adapting. Like, what do we advise them to do? How do we go down that path? Um, uh, that's, look, that's a great question because whether it's whether it's a personal health challenge or crisis, whether it's something of a global scale, I think the point of power always has to start with self, um, because you you know what we focus on and a big theme in a lot of the work we do is navigating certainty in uncertain times. So how do you find certainty, you know? And I, I totally get that with your audience. When that, I guess the difference would be that with what's going on right now, everybody may not have the physical limitations to be able to navigate that. Whereas a lot of the people that you, you who are actually listening to this may have had their physical capacity curtailed. And that in my mind would have been a lot scarier to be honest. Um, so, I think the, the, the starting point always has to be a point of power and say, okay, what can I control? What, what you know, and, and the primal part of the brain, the, the elephant that's running the show has to be quietened down first. And so if you're going to have physical challenges, if you're going to have um, global uncertainty, it's quietening down the primitive part of the brain and saying, you know what, I'm safe. I'm walking on the ground and that's holding me up and doing whatever it takes to slow down that, stress response because whether you're recovering from stroke or whether you're recovering from any ailment whether you're trying to navigate and make great sense of decisions you're not going to make them if you're in a stress state when your brain is options are shut down to only focus on just survival right this second they're not going to be asking different questions or open up to different possibilities so to me the point of power is slow it down like you said earlier breathe and get grounded and centered in self and from that place so the, the analogy I always draw is peak, peak, you know, the level of peak state. And I was explaining to someone just recently is if you've got a racing car and you know when it might be under revving, right on track and over revving. Now, if, if it's running on, if it's over revving, it's running too hard, the system's going to basically crash. If it's under revving, it's not basically thriving at its optimum potential. But when it's just right, you know that that's when it's going to perform at the best. And like the person, the under-revving signifies they've, they've got fear, they've got doubt, they've got uncertainty, they're not really sure um, what to do. And the over-revving is when they're running on anger and you know ego and, and frustration. And that's not going to be the, the great point to make great decisions either. So the, the, the point of empowerment we, we always talk about is get grounded and try and get back to that central place. place. And if you're under-revving or over-revving, don't make decisions from that place. It's just get back to core truth and core power and begin from that place. You're a doctor of chiropractic. You and yeah. your wife, Bettina, run a practice yeah. in um, 
in Melbourne, Australia, and yep. and you you see people come across to you to have their problems solved by you um, because that's what people do. They go to healthcare professionals to fix a problem that they have, and if by any chance the healthcare professional does fix the problem or make it go away, it kind of makes it possible for the person who's unwell to go, oh, well, that's a great solution. The solution is something's wrong with me. I go to somebody else to fix it. Pass the responsibility yeah. to you so that you can solve the problem. Yeah. Now, what some of those people may not realize is they're coming to you with physical problems that are starting from uh, fear-driven challenges. So yeah. they're in fear um, and it manifests in a way that is causing them discomfort in their body somewhere. Yeah. And you guys sort them out temporarily and then they go away doing the same things that they've always done. And then they have yeah. the same problem they've always had. They come back to you yeah. and they miss the point perhaps that they are very much empowered. They actually have a lot of ability to positively impact the health and well-being of their body simply by changing their state and not going into fear. Totally. Yeah. How do you guys speak to your clients about um, managing stresses and things that are causing them to potentially be negatively impact their bodily functions? Yeah. Look, that's a great question because um, we, that's right, Bettina and I have a background in, in health and chiropractic. So a lot of our uh guiding principles are built on the paradigms or the foundational principles of our profession and one of the ones that we the way we explain it is health is like a triad there's a physical there's a chemical there's an emotional component and and a lot of the times we've been conditioned to believe that all the issues are physically based so we'll look at um you know pe people might come in and say hey listen i'm having a, an issue with my health my spine and their input level is they're going to look at it from a physical component. I, I sat too long, I lifted, I did this and that, and that's well and good. But what happens is that if they're neglecting the other two components that that uh, that could be just as equally, if not more important than that, they could be looking at their chemical component. So if they're not hydrated, if they're not nutritionally looking after themselves, that's going to create a stress response in the body. And, and or the emotional component, by large, you know, this is what we're finding and this is what we are finding anytime there is, you know, whenever, when 9-11 came around, when SARS came around, um, it drives people into a physical, um, so into a stress response. And that then overloads anything else that's going on. So quite often, we, when, when we've consulted with people, they'll come in with a physical issue or they're perceiving in that, but the driver is not a physical factor. Quite often, no people will go, listen, I'm, I'm doing everything physical. I'm doing my stretches. I'm walking, whatever. We go, look, I get that. But let's do an audit of your emotional life. Let's have a little bit of audit of your nutrition. What are you doing here? And if two-thirds of the equation are not being addressed, you're not going to break the cycle. And so we're, we're locking in um, a limitation of capacity. We'll only get to a certain point because there are so many other variables we just can't even address uh, in that scenario. So um, it's, it's massive. My, um, my sense of stroke uh, recovery was that the biggest job that I had was to manage the people around me. If I was able to, <laughs> if I was able to manage them yeah. and they weren't overreacting and over responding and being um, you know, too emotional and all that kind of thing, then I was able to remain calmer and keep everyone yeah. calm. So why I say that is because I want to allude to the fact that right now people will be consuming uh, uh, far more media, uh, especially um, news type stories around the coronavirus issue. Yeah. And you're not going to be able to influence them in telling you, um, in, in calming down and not spreading um, fear and anxiety the way that they do. So what you can control is that situation where you're taking steps to limit that type of information and yeah. not consume news and media and i don't normally consume the news and the media in that way but this morning i happened to be watching a uh a, 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 a news a television news station in in australia in melbourne the nine news and i just my eyes just caught the background and the clothing 
of the two news presenters. Mm. And the background had just really made me curious. It was kind of like a, it was like a, like a deep green color, aqua type of color. And the image of the virus had changed, they had changed it to black and they were wearing black clothing. Mm. And I just got curious about that. And I thought, I wonder what they were wearing yesterday and I went on to have a look and see what they were wearing yesterday when they made some social media posts on Facebook and that. And they were wearing, the, the, the male was wearing uh, just a traditional suit with a tie and a white shirt. The female was wearing a really bright outfit and the background was really bright and colorful. And there was no other information that would suggest that if you just saw that image that there was something else going on that was dramatic or serious. And it just made me really angry that not only are we being uh, bombarded by um, the, the, the constant talk around all of the challenges and all the issues that, that we're facing right now, but then they did this sneaky, subtle thing to also impact the unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And I felt impacted by that and I know better so I'm okay about it. But let's talk a little bit about what happens when the unconscious mind is being influenced and we are not aware of it. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of, um, it, it's a very good point. I'm going to bring it back to your, some of the stroke uh, audience there, which I think is quite relevant. So <laughs> you can imagine when, when, when emotions are at their heightened state, the the brain the senses are most receptive to any message they receive any message and so whether it's positive or negative so to me it's essential that in a in a healing environment in a healthy environment we've got to be really careful that we don't project any of our own personal thoughts feelings doubts uncertainties to someone because they're highly receptive in that state so anytime you know that we've had someone who's beginning their journey in 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 um in recovery it's really really important and we're super super aware that we don't we can't pollute that space we can't pollute that um possibility for that person if someone outright at us says do you think i'll ever recover we've got to say listen you know what i don't know but what i do know is this i'm going to work on this and this and this and this but if i you know i've heard horrific stories of people who are in recovery who hear messages while they're in a highly vulnerable, receptive state that impacts on their capacity to heal and recover. Someone's perception of what is possible for you. And I, I just get really frustrated at that because it's not my right as a health provider to tell you what is possible for you. I really don't. I, I feel really uh, passionate about that. I, what I'm basically saying is I don't know. I'm going to put it, I'm going to do what I can and give whatever outlet whatever belief system you have whatever higher power you believe in i'm going to pass it over to them but effectively what i'm doing is allowing your body and giving it every opportunity to heal and recover and grow without the agenda without the limitations that i'm putting on that we're putting on you so to me anything that we say whether we're you know whether we're um working with people when we're coaching people i'm super 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 aware of what I say and what I say has to be intentional. Otherwise it permeates into the subconscious mind. It can really mess somebody up. And so to me, it's all about possibility, reaffirming all that is possible, empowering that person to be the captain of their own journey. And it's not about me to tell them what's possible or not. They're going to be the driver of their shit. That's how I look at it anyway. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. It's however, you know, consuming, um, that type of media, unfortunately, these guys layer in things that we're not aware of and having an awareness that potentially people are trying to manipulate you so that they can increase their ratings, so that they can um, have some sense of control over you so that you can keep watching um, and make it about something that it's not really about, which is those types of shows are not really about sharing information so that you can be um, uh, aware it's more about keeping you there so that they can sell advertising. Yeah, well, um, it's about opening up enough loops in your brain to want to know what's going to happen next, but create enough fear and doubt 
and uncertainty in you that you don't go, I think I've got this, you know, or um, yeah, it's a very subtle and, um, you know, they use it in marketing all the time uh, in there, but it, it yeah, I'm going to get controversial here. And, uh, but it's the, the politicalization of healthcare um, is huge. And there's agendas being run far greater than you or I collectively know, um, but they're re driven because of an outcome. And people want a particular outcome, and and you, you know you influence enough people who are uncertain. That's 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 pretty much how you you get your agenda or your your movement to to progress. And uh, you know there are regulatory um, restrictions in terms of what I can do and say, but I I, I table that to say that there there are bigger there are bigger. Uh, there's the invisible hand that drives health um, far greater than you and I could possibly imagine. Yeah, stroke survivors uh, that I've come across will often tell me that their doctor said that they weren't going to walk again, that the doctor said to them um, that they were never going to use their arm again or talk or any of those things. And there's so many people that have just proved them wrong. And yeah. the ones that have proved them wrong who are listening and the ones who have not yet proved them wrong but are getting there who are listening yeah. um, need to take the same approach to... Um, that they did to those doctors to prove them wrong and need to take control of what they can control and take responsibility yeah. for how they recover and how they feel. They need to do the same thing in this situation with the way that fear and anxiety has been spread by other people to influence us in a negative way. It's about time that you yeah. just started paying attention to this external influence and go to and say to yourself, you know what? I don't believe you. I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing and I'm going to get better. Now, that's not to say that you're not going to self-isolate because that's the smart move, especially if you're recovering from stroke. That's not to say that you're not going to be more careful in washing your hands and just paying attention to um, not be around crowds for a little while. That's not going to say that you're not going to do that. But at the same time, take back the, the give yourself the strength and take back um, a little bit of the control and don't yeah. allow other people to influence you in a negative way so that um, they aren't getting their agenda across their agenda across to you whether they are intending it or they're just projecting their fears and their concerns yeah 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 that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much how, how I view it um, exactly so so just to wrap up because I know that you're short of time thanks so much for being yeah. here but just to wrap oh, up pleasure. Tell me a little bit about what, what the first step is to, um, to adapting in this time because people are used to doing the same thing over and over again and now they have to adapt and they have to adapt rapidly pretty much overnight. And it's okay that they don't know exactly how to do that yet and, how, uh, and, and that they may not have all the resources to do that yet. What would be the first thing that people need to start doing with regards to adapting? Yeah, great question. See, a lot of the time, um, like I was alluding to, I think the, the per first step is to get grounded in self first. And when, whenever you're in overwhelm, it's because you've got so much data and information coming at you thick and fast. It could be emotions. It could be everything. So once you slow things down and get all centered, it's, it's not knowing what the first step is. And so that first step, like a lot of the times what I find is people are overwhelmed. They've got all these areas, options. They're thinking about step 17 when really they should be thinking about step one. Nice. And so to me, I, I, I always encourage people to go, if you're, if you're overwhelmed, let's get yourself grounded. Let's get yourself back to your most resourceful state. If you're under, under thro um, throttling or overthrowing, just get back to center. And from there, when you're clear, when you're as calm as possible, What's the first thing that you could do? What is it a conversation? Is it a open something up? Is it, I don't know what it is. It's just take the control back and set the intention first step. And when you do that first step, whatever that first step is, the second step may then become apparent. In which case you go, okay, that's now that's the next step. And then once the second step up, all the next steps will open up to you. But it's really hard to know all those steps right now. And because right now in the world, no one knows what step 15 is right now. All we've got to focus on is what's step one. And step one, well, if you sell it, the way I always explain it is if you can imagine like a pier, if you can imagine going out to beach, you've got to set the plank down solid, then you've got to set the next one right next to it. 
If you miss planks trying to jump through steps, you're going to fall through. But if you solidify that path and just consolidate one step, great, I've got one step. What's my next one? And just building it. Before you know it, you're at step 17, but you've consolidated those 16 steps. So that, that's, that's pretty much whatever that first step is. It could be a physical, chemical, it could be an emotional step that will do that. It would be something that um, could be getting your breathing back. It could be getting a little bit more information, whatever it is, but do it from the point of power. I think they're, they're always when we make our best decision. Beautiful. Jim, you and Batena do amazing work. If somebody wanted to reach out and just uh, find out a little bit, of, a little more about what it is that you guys do, where would they go? Uh, thank you. Well, yeah, look, there's, our background is in, is in healthcare. So it is in um, chiropractic. Our practice is in Moreland Road. Brunswick West in, in Victoria. Um, a lot of the work that we do, particularly we've applied a lot of what we focus on in healthcare and, and, and coached healthcare professionals and other teams. We do that through Lux Consulting, which is our, our coaching and, and consulting organization. That's probably um, where we spent, share a lot of the principles that we talked about today. And having the advantage of having a health background, we can integrate that to, to make it more relevant. So um, thank you for the opportunity to have a chat to you today. And uh, um, oh, yeah, really grateful for it. And it's, it's helped solidify and reinforce a lot of uh, um, what I've been sort of working on the last little while as well. Yeah, well done. Thanks, Jim. Discover how to support your recovery after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com.